I love that prayer we just um, participated in together because it reminds us kind of what I talked about right at the beginning and that um, on an evening when uh, so many in our culture and so many around the world will, will seemingly anchor their hope in nothing more than a date change tomorrow, that it's a new year, therefore I have hope, when we can anchor a hope in the Lord of all time itself and the creator of all time itself, the one who does have the power to give us a truly clean slate to begin uh, a new year. And that's what we remember just there in that prayer, what we'll remember just a few moments as we go to the tables of communion. Well, uh, Christmas has come and gone once again. Uh, we were putting away the Christmas stuff, started to put it away today, and uh, my wife always is the one who initiates that. She kind of wants to get things back to normal, and I kind of drag my feet because it makes me sad to take down all the Christmas stuff. And First of all, I don't like doing all the work, but I, I, it makes me kind of sad because I really like Christmas time and all, it, all the memories it brings and all the fun it brings. It means life is getting ready to go back to normal, but we started putting away all the Christmas stuff, all the wrapping papers and stuffed in bags, and it's on its way to landfills. Empty boxes are stored in the attic until next year. But I have enjoyed seeing um, all the social media posts of younger children having fun with their Christmas gifts. Did you watch any of that stuff? Have you been watching social media? Maybe I look at it too much, but I even saw a list of the top Christmas gifts for 2016. At the very top were two gifts that we did not have in our house. Maybe you had in your house. The first one was something called Hatchimals. Anybody here get a Hatchimal or give a Hatchimal? Nobody? You tried? Well, I, did you see the story of the, of the parents who were upset? That toy sold for something like $57. But parents were paying four times that amount on a black market to buy them from people who had hoarded them. And then when they gave them to their kids, some of these hatchimals didn't hatch. There's supposed to be a little creature in there that hatches out on its own like a dinosaur egg. And they didn't hatch. And parents were upset. Some of them said they performed cesarean sections <laughs> on the hatchimals to get the little thing out. Uh, and so they want all their money back. So it was a big, big issue. Second one, which we didn't have, is called Pie Face Showdown. Anybody have a Pie Face Showdown? Okay, in case you're wondering what Pie Face Showdown is, and I wondered, uh, this is what it looks like. No, run the, run the video, John. <laughs> Merry Christmas, everyone, right? That looks about right with uh, boys in the house. Well, how many of you had one of these toys growing up? A few more? Look at that. All the high-tech toys, and you guys have one of these at home. Well, the magic screen, as it was originally called, was invented by a French inventor named André Cassagne, but he had trouble marketing the toy in the late 1950s in Europe. So eventually, not knowing what to do, he sold his idea to the Ohio Art Company for $1,500. The Ohio Art Company changed the name to Etch-A-Sketch and introduced it to the American public in 1961 or so, and it went on to sell over 100 million Etch-A-Sketches over the last 50 or 60 years or so. Etch-A-Sketch is now considered one of the greatest toys of the 20th century. It is actually in, did you know this thing existed? The Toy Hall of Fame, Etch-A-Sketch. You know how it works. You know you have these two little knobs, and you, you use them to make the little line go up and down and sideways, right? You know how it works? Well, if you're really patient, you can make some pretty cool images with the Etch-A-Sketch. Look at some of the things I found. For example, if you're patient enough, you can actually make that. That's a real picture. People, do, they draw on them, and then they take the back off, and they, they put them in frames, and they sell them as artwork. There's Elvis. How about this one? A little more appropriate for tonight. Okay. You recognize this lady. That looks too good to even be true, doesn't it? but people can make these things. Now, my personal specialty was steps. <laughs> I was really good at making steps. Right angles were my thing. But the great thing about an Etsy sketch, as you know, is that when you mess up, you know, you're trying to do Mona Lisa and you make her smile wrong, and you mess up, then all you have to do is shake it, right? And that fine aluminum powder in there, or whatever it is, would magically just cover all your mistakes, and you got a fresh, clean slate. Now, I'm pretty sure that Andre Cassagna had no idea that this toy he created in his basement so long ago would be that popular. If he did, he wouldn't have sold it for 1500 bucks, right? He'd be a millionaire. 
I also think he didn't have any idea it would give us, people who believe in the gospel, a beautiful example of actually what we believe and what we celebrate here tonight. The Bible teaches us that sin is like an ugly mark on the screen of our lives. But by faith in Christ, the blotches, those ugly blotches, uh, are erased and we can be made like new. That's what we sang about a few moments ago. For those of us who believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, that's what communion, the bread and cup, are all about, which we're going to get to in just a moment. Let me read one passage for you from Colossians chapter 2 in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul is writing, he writes, When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, that's a reference to the Old Testament, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. I just want to say a few words about this text and have it guide us into uh, the time around the tables. First thing Paul says is, you were dead, he says. That's a pretty dramatic statement. You were dead. My wife and I, uh, a couple weeks ago, had a chance to go to San Francisco to watch our youngest son play basketball out there. And one of the things we did while we were there was visit Alcatraz Island. Anybody here visited Alcatraz? Oh, yeah, so you'll know what I'm talking about. They've, you know that for three or four decades, Alcatraz was the most famous maximum security prison in America, um, housing some of the most dangerous and violent criminals in our country, people like Al Scarface Capone, he was there for a while, Robert Birdman Stroud, George Machine Gun Kelly, and it goes on and on, it was both fascinating and sobering to, be, to, be, to take a tour of that, that prison. They've restored it so you can, you can actually see the cells where these men lived, five feet by seven feet by nine feet, uh, every single cell solitary, and how they lived. And there was, you, you had a headset and you, it took you on a guided tour in detail, and you actually heard voices of former inmates and guards telling their stories as you walked around. It was just fascinating, really well done. But one of the voices you heard on your headset was a prisoner who had, was in Alcatraz for 15 years. Okay, 15 years living on that rock. Close enough to San Francisco to see and sometimes even to smell the chocolate from Girardelli Square, but too, too far never be able to be able to, to actually live that life. So for 15 years, and this particular prisoner, in those 15 years, didn't receive a single visit, not even a single letter in 15 years. And what he said about himself was, I was dead inside, see? You couldn't hurt me no more, he said. It was sad to hear. Paul says, when you were dead in your sins. Now what does he mean? How does sin bring death? Now to understand, we have to remind ourselves of what sin actually is. Sin is not making a mistake. It's not uh, doing something that's wrong. It's much more than it. Sin, at its heart, is disregarding God. Sin is ignoring, kind of a spitting in the face of God. Sin is saying to God, you don't know what's best for me. Only I know what's best for me. Sin is saying, I can decide what's good and bad for me. It's exactly what Adam and Eve did way back in Genesis 1 through 3 that we covered late earlier this fall in the garden. We can decide what's best for us. We don't have to regard your limits. So ultimately, sin is kind of worshiping myself. And all sin destroys. When God established the limits of the Garden of Eden, when he said you can have anything in the garden to eat except do not eat from that one tree, he didn't say you may not eat of that tree because I said so. He didn't say you may not eat of that tree because I don't want you to have any fun. He said, you may not eat of that tree because if you eat of it, you will surely die, he said. Sin is sin because it kills. All sin ultimately destroys everything it touches. First, sin destroys my relationship with my Creator, with my God. Then it destroys my relationships with others. And then finally, it destroys my soul. So sin ultimately leaves us in the prison of our own making. See, I was dead inside, that prisoner said. We've not just made a mistake. We're not just in a little trouble. We don't just need a little help. Paul says, the truth is, you were once dead. 
dead in your sin, spiritually dead. And then he says, and at that time when you were dead, God made you alive. He says, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. Let me go through this part of the verse. Paul says, God makes us alive with Christ. How? How does he do that? He says, by forgiving all our sins. I want you to remember that little word, all. We're going to come back to it in just a few moments. He says, by canceling the charge of our legal indebtedness. That's, that's a very complicated phrase in Greek. It's very formal legal language. Uh, when we were in San Francisco, I had a really dumb thing happen. I had a rental car. We wanted to get coffee. We're on it. We're in, in a, we, we drove up uh, close to where one of my son's games were. Just needed to get in a coffee shop, but it's really hard to park in California. And, and so there was cars everywhere. So we found this, finally found this one place, got lucky, right in front of the, the little coffee shop. And so I pulled in in the rental car, and they have all these meters. Well, they had like one meter for every five or ten spaces, so you, you kind of had to figure it out. Uh, and there was actually a guy, uh, I don't know if he's a street person, sitting right next to this meter, who when I walked up, he said, oh, you don't have to do that. This is, it's, it's close to a holiday. They're not even going to check. Uh, but I was nervous. I'm out of towner. You know, I'm, I'm like, oh, I'm looking at it. He goes, no, you don't have to. He told me like three times, you don't even have to pay that. They won't even check. But I did anyway. I took my card, read it, tried to read it. It was a little tiny print, and I put my card in, and hit okay. I'm hitting the buzz. I don't really know what's worth. Finally, it spits, spits out a ticket. So, okay, at least I got my ticket, put it inside my windshield, and we went to the coffee shop. We were in the coffee shop five minutes. Had just ordered a coffee. Didn't have our coffee yet. I look out the window, and there's one of those guys in the little, little police like scooter thing parked right next to my rental car. I'm like, oh no. And I, I said, I'm gonna, I gotta go out. Maybe I, and I, so I ran across the street up to this guy right as he finished putting the ticket on my windshield. And I said, hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, this is my rental car. Did I do something wrong? I had a ticket. He goes, well, your ticket's expired. I said, what? I just got it. He goes, I, I'm sorry, sir. It was expired. He's really nice. And he, and he pointed to it. And I bought a ticket for like eight minutes. <laughs> it charged me a quarter. What kind of a place that this charges you a quarter for? A Anyway, so it's a $43 ticket, okay? So I have a ret written record. He said, I've written it down already. I can't take it out. It's already, in, so you're going to have to write them a letter. So I've got to send it back to them, write them a letter, and try to get someone there who has the authority to cancel that ticket. That's what Paul's talking about. There's a record written down of your violations, and it's written in stone. No one has the authority to cancel that ticket except one. He's talking about a legal document, a note of indebtedness, he says the legal debt has been canceled, deleted, wiped away, torn up. How? Why? Because it was nailed to the cross, which leads us to, thirdly, the triumph of the cross. Most of us here in this room have lived with the gospel, have lived with the story of Jesus long enough that we think of the cross as a symbol of our faith, as, a, as a, almost a thing of beauty. In fact, uh, I would guess... A number of you are wearing a cross as an element of jewelry even here tonight uh, because it has become that kind of symbol for us, but it hasn't always been so. In the ancient world, historically, the cross was seen as a brutal instrument of torture and death, not unlike, but worse than, a guillotine or an electric chair. Those two things kill prisoners right away. The cross took days because it tortured first. So the earliest Christians did not wear crosses around their necks. They didn't use it as a symbol because it was far too brutal and it was actually dangerous to identify with the cross. Rather, the earliest symbols that Christians used were the fish and the anchor. The fish because the Greek word for fish, ichthus, is kind of an acrostic for the words Jesus Christ, God's Son, Savior. So that became the symbol of the early church. They would draw it in the sand. They would write it, put it into, into mosaics. They would, that was the symbol that Christians were there. Or there was a meeting of the people who followed Jesus. The other symbol was the anchor, which comes from Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul. So the anchor became an early symbol of the church. So when Paul writes, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. He's actually transforming for this early body of believers the meaning of the cross from a symbol of death to the symbol of triumph and life. It's Paul who's making that transition. He's actually referring here to an ancient Roman military tradition 
when Roman generals uh, would win battles, they would parade back into the great city in what's called a triumphal procession. And you can look it up in history books. They would come in these uh, chariot-drawn, I mean, horse-drawn chariots with all their, their regalia on, and they would be dragging behind them the conquered troops, the conquered prisoners, in sort of a public shaming event through the streets of Rome. That's the image Paul is using for us here. He's saying, through the cross, Jesus has disarmed and defeated the enemies of sin and death once and for all, and we now join him in that great triumphal procession. It's an incredible image of transformation that we celebrate here this evening. So as we finish 2016, whatever that year the year past has held for you. And I can't even begin to imagine the memories and the experiences, good, bad, ugly, beautiful, otherwise, that you hold in your memory and your heart. I want you to go back to that one little word in verse 13 when it says, He forgave us all our sin. That's a surprisingly powerful word for me, all. Not some, not most, not the most forgivable, not all except the most serious, not all except that one. You know, that one, <laughs> you're on your own on that one. All, he says, all, just like that. And that takes me back to the Etch-a-Sketch. You know, when you shake the Etch-a-Sketch, you know, it, doesn't, it doesn't leave any marks at all. It covers them all. It doesn't matter if it's a big blotch or a little blotch, it covers them all. That's what Paul says canceled. All the written code canceled. The debt is zero. In 2 Corinthians 5, Paul summarizes by saying, therefore, because of the truth we have just looked at, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. 